My name is Damon Dagnoni. Uh, on behalf of the Humanity and Healthcare uh, Speaker Series team, it's a delight to have uh, many of you back for the second uh, session in our series. Uh, and it's also great to have those of you um, for the first time. We um, are a team of healthcare providers across all three schools at Queen's University. Uh, and um, we are hoping over the, the coming weeks and months uh, of this academic year to, to create uh, a space for important conversations to highlight our collective experience uh, taking care of patients. Um, we certainly want to promote professional development uh, across the continuum. So undergraduate, postgraduate, continuing professional development that prior prioritizes the care team. And we also wanna create a space for us to have opportunity to have some reflection together. And so each session will be, will have a highlighted speaker and uh, with a little bit of presentation and hopefully a lot of discussion. Um, of course, we want to acknowledge the land where uh, we come together. And so to begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Queens is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We're very grateful to play, live, and learn on these lands. And so we say thank you very, very much. And also, um, this is a very intended to be a very inclusive uh, and, and safe environment. Uh, I mentioned before, for all learners, for patient advocates, for ourselves as uh, professional uh, independent practitioners within healthcare, we want everybody to feel. Uh, safe and included. Um, we have a few planning committee disclosures from different grants and things that we have been uh, involved with over the last uh, number of years and going forward. We have no specific commercial support at this time. And we do take a number of actions to try to mitigate potential uh, bias, as you can see here. Most importantly, we, we really ask for your feedback, um, both during the sessions, after the sessions in your evaluation forms. Um, and going forward, uh, you know, we hope to incorporate a lot of your feedback into the upcoming sessions. We are on the Zoom platform and during uh, the sessions, we will ask everybody to please make sure that you're on mute. Um, as, a, as a presenter, I think most of us during this pandemic have had the opportunity to make presentations. Um, it is really nice to see faces, um, but uh, please feel free to stop your video or pause your video at any point in time um, if you feel the need or you don't feel comfortable with your video on. Sometimes some of our sessions can evoke uh, a little bit more strong emotional response. So um, you'll see the stop video on the left lower uh, portion of your screen. Uh, the mute button is there. And we encourage everybody throughout the presentation to ask questions or make comments using the chat function. Myself and Catherine Donnelly um, and Ernest Nelgrove Clark and Shana Watson, um, who are members of the HHC team, will be monitoring this chat. Uh, and for today's session, it will be mostly myself and, and Catherine uh, moderating, but uh, we'll all be uh, taking part. And so that brings us to um, our speaker. I'm delighted to uh, introduce Dr. Rosemary Wilson, um, who's going to give us a, a really great talk and, and story about the trajectory of her career uh, and the struggles and challenges and the um, way that she approaches her um, delivery of healthcare in an, in, on an interprofessional team, which is how most of us do practice. Um, Rosemary is the Associate Director of Graduate Nursing and Health Quality Programs. She is an Associate Professor in the School of Nursing in the Department of uh, Anesthesia, Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine. She is a Nurse Practitioner 
focusing primarily on chronic pain care at KHSC, uh, previously at the KGH site, now mostly at the Hotel Du site. And she's also the mom of boys, a grateful spouse, a crazy sailor, uh, and a home renovator. Thank you very much for, to everybody for coming. And I, I, um, I'm going to be human right up front and tell you that I'm nervous um, because I have never talked about uh, what brought me to where I am now before. Um, and certainly not, uh, maybe, maybe uh, with a beer amongst friends, um, but never in a large group, so uh, bear with me. I am not speaking about chronic pain uh, practice specifically. Um, I'm not talking about evidence, which is unusual for me, although there will be some. Um, as the Deputy Director of the Queen's Collaboration for Healthcare Quality, um, I always talk about evidence, and so I'm going to set that aside. Um, but I'm going to use my experience as a nurse practitioner caring for patients in pain um, as an exemplar to talk about what it was like and what it is like um, to build something new in an environment. Um, maybe not, not novel in some of the larger centers, but certainly um, in the 21 years I've been here, there's been lots of building happening um, and maybe not what university well established. Um, I've used the term uh, at the edges of practice because I have often felt over my, over my 21 years here in, in Kingston um, that I have been on something like an edge. Um, somebody told me it was the bleeding edge at one point, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting, and, and all that in, entails. So my intent really is to talk to you about trust and collegiality, uh, what's worked for me and what didn't, um, my epic fails and my triumphs, and I hope that uh, you have a quite well-intended good laugh at my antics um, and leave with some ideas to form for team building in your own settings. Well, here are my disclosures. I was fortunate to get a CIHR grant. Um, I'm part of a, a large team um, investigating uh, some, some uh, interventions for chronic pain. Um, I do a little review on the side, but that's it. And I'm faculty and I practice. So the objectives I know that you have probably seen, um, I want to talk to you about personal vul vulnerability and humanity um, and justice uh, when it comes to patients that are suffering, um, because I think that is the most important thing that, um, that we do as healthcare providers is to, to be just and human with our patients and with their families and with each other. So way back in 2000, actually I'll go back as far as 1998, um, I was at Dalhousie doing my master's degree and I finished up in May 2000 and I got, that I graduated the 25th, the 26th I got a call from the vice president of, pa from, of patient care from KGH who was looking for somebody to fill a role. Um, she'd heard about me, I'm the second grad at the Dow's NP program uh, and the second ever grad. <laughs> um, we've had lots of, pro lots of folks since, but uh, there weren't that many of us around. And in fact, at KGH at the time, there were only three uh, nurse practitioners um, who came before. We all were within a few, a few months of each other um, starting our roles. And there were few across Ontario, um, less than 10 uh, nurse practitioners doing acute care practice uh, at the time. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the people that came before me. I took the job. Um, Luane Davis, who scared the living daylights out of me, um, who some of you may remember was the vice president of patient care. And uh, it was a fantastic opportunity. I couldn't turn it down. So I moved from Halifax to Kingston. Um, those that came before are two incredible nurses that were in the um, coordinator role, uh, not in an NP role before, who, try, who tried really hard to work with the staff um, and had made lots of headway uh, to try and start setting up the acute pain service at, at KHSC, um, KGH back then. In the early days, um, there were a few anesthesiologists uh, a really great pharmacist, Ron Koob, who you see here. So this picture um, is in the public domain. Um, it used to be on the wall at, on, in front of many of the, the um, elevators at KGH, pretty funny. 
Um, you can certainly see the difference between uh, at the beginning, within a few few months of my starting at KGH, and what we all looked like, like quite a few light, uh, years later with dark circles and in some cases less hair, um, in some cases more hair. So uh, um, the pain team, our primary goal was to deal with perioperative pain uh, and trauma. So we did a lot of work uh, in the recovery room across all the surgical units, but very quickly uh, because we were out there, we were um, on the nursing units, we expanded to some chronic um, and palliative as well. The early days of the pain team were, were unusual um, and difficult, I think. It was a new team, there were new people on it. Um, I was new to the role, so we had a bunch of really interesting things happening all at the same time. Nurse practitioner role that was relatively new, a pain service that had, in, had, to, inter, had to interact with a multiplicity of disciplines and uni, nursing units and surgical specialties and medical specialties um, and the administration. Um, so it was a tough time and there were a number of anesthesiologists on the team as well. So we, we were all in the beginning trying to do something really important and that's dealing with the suffering of individuals. And I would be ingenuine if I didn't tell you that in the beginning the pain was, pain for patients was life-changing. Watching people in pain and working as hard as you could to do something about it, especially acute pain, is particularly life-changing to watch. Um, it really galvanized all of us uh, to try to do the best thing we could. But I'll tell you that just because you have the credentials behind your name and just because you're part of a team and somebody plops you into a role doesn't mean people trust you from the beginning. Your colleagues don't know, maybe don't understand your role. Um, your colleagues across the different disciplines don't understand, maybe don't know you well, don't know what you're capable of, where the edges of your practice are and where your knowledge and skills are. So I made the mistake early on of demanding that trust, um, of, of not recognizing that I had to earn it. And so it was a frustrating time. Um, as a team, I think we, we struggled to get along. We struggled to get along with others. Um, we needed to deal with our consistency and we needed to develop a unified approach as a team. Um, and we needed to respond to everything in a unified way from calls from nursing staff to concerns by, from specialists to concerns from administration to purchasing devices. It was easier with some team members across the disciplines, not so easy with others. Um, and we all learned important things. For example, at the time, um, I found that I, if I could get an, an allyship with unit clerks, that it really helped me a lot. And then I could get in with the um, charge nurses and I could talk to the charge nurses and ask them about how things were going and really listen and be authentic. That would change things. And so I started to learn about the environment um, and learn about my colleagues. At the same time, uh oh. Um, at the same time, I was reading a lot. Um, one thing I discovered that in trying to build trust among team members, especially in that kind of environment when you're doing something new, is understanding what the evidence was and having the evidence at your fingertips was key. So to be able to talk about that most recent systematic review or critique that um, most recent article um, was really, really important. And I learned some of that approach from, because I was reading a lot of Glasser, and Glasser was a psychiatrist um, back in the 90s who talked about the seven caring habits, and that's supporting, encouraging, listening, accepting, trusting, respecting, and negotiating differences. And that was, reading this was a game changer for me, I have to say. And one of the things that Glasser said was, um, back in 99, we choose everything we do, including the misery we feel. So I had to make a choice to take a step back 
I was saying to, to Damon, um, figuring out which were the hills that I wanted to die on and which were the ones that were, you know, the battles that weren't important to fight and the ones that were, what were my own values um, and what were the values of my colleagues. Uh, getting to that place actually made a huge difference in establishing a trusting interprofessional relationship. And the other thing I learned from reading Glasser was that the only person's behavior we can control is our own because all we do is behave. So it was all with me. I couldn't blame anybody else. Um, I had to take it on myself. So this actually turns up in some Brené Brown um, work as well. And she talks about the foundations for relationships has to be trust. And, and I, that's what we were working towards as a group. And she uses the acronym BRAVING, which I think is kind of cool. Um, it definitely resonates with me now, having, having been through it. Um, you know, respecting everybody's boundaries, being reliable. And, and on the pain service, that was the most important thing. You had to do what you said you were gonna do. They had to be able to count on you. The staff had to be able to count on you. They wanted to be able to phone you and, and have you there to help them at a moment's notice. That was key. Um, and saying, if you're gonna come, if, you're, if you say you're gonna come back, come back. Um, this idea of vault, keeping your confidences to yourself, keeping things to yourself, demonstrating your own values, not just talking about it, um, not being judgmental, and the most important, I think, um, showing generosity and in interpretation. So some people uh, mess up in their communication, and if you're generous and you accept um, that they uh, mean well and they're coming from a good place, um, I think that's, uh, that's key in this whole idea of trust. So we can also apply this to ourselves, self, which I think is really important. Um, so I, I think we have to look at all of this because fear really leads us astray if we're afraid of things. Um, but sometimes arrogance can be even more dangerous. So I did promise you some evidence. So some of the things I'm talking about actually comes out um, in the Journal of Interprofessional Care uh, with some, some scholars uh, um, that I'm familiar with, uh, that some of you might be as well. Trust and respect, um, team members have to be clear about their roles and in an interprofessional team such as the pain service, being able to figure out who was responsible for what and who brings what to the table um, was key. Uh, and trusting that everybody else's people are competent when they're making clinical decisions that they will um, follow through that that uh, um, what their professional identity was um, and and how they fit uh, within the team and how important that collaborative practice is towards towards uh, moving towards a common goal um, which is also key in this in this particular study um, metasynthesis the shared vision and common goals is really, really important. So I want to tell you just a quick story about um, one, of the, one of the frustrations that, um, that I faced often was that, and, and nurses do this, uh, we do have done this to ourselves, I think, in many ways. We have so many names for different roles in nursing. It's, it's a small wonder that um, it's difficult for people to figure out who does what and when. So, so one of my colleagues used to call me a, a myriad of different things. So I was the pain nurse, I was the pain coordinator, I was the nurse coordinator, I was the specialist nurse, um, all kinds of different things. And, and so I actually, I thought I have to deal with this. So I made up a bunch of little recipe cards and I had on them, probably made about 20 of them. And I had things that I am and I would list all the things that I could be called, nurse practitioner, advanced practice nurse, you know, clinical nurse specialist, nurse practitioner, which was my title at the time, um, and things that I was not, pain nurse, <laughs> all of these things. At least get my title right. If you don't, can't figure out how I fit in the role, just call me the same thing. And, and when my colleague would start calling me something else, I'd just hand him the recipe card and move on. And I use them all. <laughs> Every one I printed up because, you know, it, it proved my point and it was really funny. 
So what do we have to do? Well, we had to find another way um, amongst the team to, to get along. So, you know, we needed to improve our communication. So one of the things we started to do, and for those of you who are in Kingston will know, this is the Kingston Brewing Company. Um, they make their own beer, it's fantastic. And they also serve this incredible dish that you can share called the Horn of Plenty, or at least they used to. It was wings and mushrooms and all kinds of cool stuff um, and fries. You know, a, a pitcher of uh, whitetail um, real ale and uh, a Horn of Plenty in the corner booth at, at, the, uh, at the brew pub for all the team members, the pharmacists, the, all the physicians, myself, any, any resident um, that was around. And we'd hash things over. We'd, we'd have an agenda. We'd talk about how we were going to deal with things. Um, some of our communication problems, uh, you know, really have a good, solid conversation. Um, and it's at that point that I really, I really think started to, things started to pick up for us um, interprofessionally. Uh, really, we, sometimes I call it catching, catching more flies with honey than vinegar. I think that's the term, um, but that's true. So we were kind and nice and respectful and human with each other, we started to get along. Big surprise, right? Um, the other things we used to do is I would breakfast together after rounds to compare notes and plan the rest of the day. Um, and we shared stories, sometimes did some teaching, um, you know, really was really good. Um, and so I, you know, I think that uh, this whole idea that, that um, smiling and, and being funny and being present with each other um, was so important to develop an attachment amongst us. And I kind of harken back to my undergraduate degree in science where I just studied the work of Bowlby and that this whole assertion that smiling um, caused this, this attachment. And I started to think about that. And some of my colleagues were really funny. And i give you another funny story. You know, the anesthesiologist, as you probably know, sometimes wear operating room gowns backwards, uh, wear the, the old fashioned green gowns and they got the little tail that they used to, to tie it up in the operating room hanging from the back. Well, I routinely used to take the tail and tie it to stuff. So I get the patients to be part of the, part of the gig. They keep the anesthesiologist talking while I tied them to an overbed table or to a door handle or to something else, you know, bedside table and of course when they went to leave they would be like oh <laughs> or we jump out from behind things and play practical jokes on each other and and really that made a huge difference that humor was really really key um, and I'm so thankful for that time because I think about it now um, with great great fondness uh, with some of the great portions of how that team functioned and so that actually is in the literature as well a big surprise there as well um, so humor really illustrates our common humanity, I think. Um, it gives us empathy, um, but it actually improves our psychological well-being. So um, it builds rapport, um, and sometimes it allows us to think about things in a different way. So you could be mad, or you could make it funny. Um, so uh, Amanda Wise calls this convivial labor, which I kind of like the term, um, but I think it's really important that we understand that, that uh, there are benefits to convivial labor, but we have to be really careful in establishing moral boundaries to joking. So what this study actually uh, was really interesting, that self-defeating humor or self-deprecating humor um, had the strongest prediction with health and psychological well-being. So this whole idea of that you can laugh at yourself uh, really, really resonates with me. Um, now this study, they're going on to talk about the uh, um, the role of dark humor, which I know we're really, really good at. So uh, I'm looking forward to part B of this study. But the self-deprecating humor and laughing at ourselves makes us human. And, and I think that's important. So we did okay. Um, we were functioning well. Uh, we started to do some road trips. Uh, that was key. That was lots of fun. Um, we did lots of research at this time. Um, as a, tier, a team, we had a common set of goals. We were talking to our on-call staff and trying to deal with the, the issues of the, from the nursing staff, from the physiotherapists that were concerned about um, patients carrying heavy pumps around and, 
Um, really, we were working to build capacity uh, in the interdisciplinary teams, the broader teams that we were dealing with, not just the sort of 12 of us, but, um, but the nursing staff and, and all the rest of the interdisciplinary team as well. Um, it's really important when you talk about getting people's feedback about things. One of the ways to establish trust with them is that you hear the feedback, you got to do something about it. Um, you got to show that you're you're taking everything into account um, and and changing practice uh, to deal with some of those issues where you can. And weirdly, buying this boat in 2006 really helped as well, um, because there's lots of questions about it, and it really offered the opportunity to share lots of common ground with people that sail. This is Kingston, the freshwater sailing capital of the world, right? So, um, I think this is a great place to take a break, Damon, if that's okay, and Catherine? Yep. Yeah. Rosemary, I'm just gonna, I was just about to jump in. Well, first I wanted to comment about the menu item, which they took off, I cannot believe. <laughs> but, you know, what really strikes me, Rosemary, as you reflect, is just how thoughtful you are in your approach to developing relationships from that very early stage in your working life, which is, I don't think, if I think back to myself, and I, probably many of us think back, we might not have been that thoughtful. And, you know, as you as you're preparing this talk and thinking, you know, if you had to go to tell your younger self, like, what would you do the same? What might you change knowing what you know now? Oh, um, I, I'd like to say in lots of ways, nothing, because there isn't an aspect of the the squabbles that we had, the, you know, the frustration, the times I was scratching my head about how to do things better that didn't improve the way I practiced you know ultimately um but I you know I, I think I would I would be kinder it was hard it was I was tired I had little children um I had was already starting to do my PhD I was exhausted and I wasn't always as kind as I could be um so I, I would be kinder I've learned a ton and um, that's probably the most important thing for me, I think. Well, and I think, you know, you fit it, and I think most of us can relate, you know, those challenging times, as hard as they are, those are those key learning points, because I always say, you know, when things are going well, you know, you don't take those times to reflect as, as one might, you know, when there are those challenges. I don't know if I wanted to, if we open it up to others on the call today, if, if they have some thoughts or comments or questions to Rosemary, sort of as we, as we pause here. I'm going to jump in for a second and um, say, you know, Rosemary, that that uh, uh, we had a really, we've had a couple of really great chats in the last uh, last night uh, and within the last couple of weeks. And and the being kinder one is, you know, that therein lies the the challenge uh, when things when things are tough um, and working in teams and. Uh, you know that sort of growth mindset of what what could I have done a little bit better? And as you mentioned before, that uh, I forget the the author that you put up, but that you know what can I control? I can control me uh, and how I frame the situation and how I act and behave. And you know I think probably some of your although you didn't use the term, but you know your your own role modeling. Uh, you were when I was a resident, junior resident. You were. Um, at the the early years um, of uh, this nurse practitioner role, and and I remember very well, um, you know, in, enjoying the the happy smiles that uh, that you describe. Um, so you're a great role model for me uh, back when I was a junior trainee. Aw, thanks, Damon. You're welcome. <laughs> well, and it strikes me too, Rosemary. You know, you you just spoke about you know, thinking about being kind and, you know, you were juggling so much at home that many of your colleagues, I imagine, may not have been fully aware of either, just like they might have been also juggling things. And, you know, as team members, we bring so much, you know, our, our, our personal lives yet may not fully acknowledge that at, in a workplace. Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, for some, some members of the interdisciplinary team, our kids went to school together, so I had some sense that we shared some commonality there, but uh, um, 
Yeah, and you don't want to make excuses, especially in a role like this where you're trying to help people to trust you and, and you don't you don't want to complain. You know, you, you want to start at 7 a.m. even though you had to drop the kids at the the daycare on your way down. I mean, it's just, you can't, it's, that's your issue, right? Mm -hmm. I guess it's that balancing act, as you were saying, you know, as you're reaching out to connect to your colleagues, you know, going out for drinks, having breakfast, and sort of those that navigation of how much to to bring of yourself and you know how to build those those relationships yeah well i can say uh you know by the end i spent almost 15 years at kgh 11 in the in on the acute pain service in the full-time role and uh um, towards the end i i considered you know my close colleagues to be family mm -hmm. we understood each other quite well which is great Mm -hmm. And, you know, I imagine it sounds like the struggles of, of teaming or forming, you know, you know, create those bonds that, you know, are so much stronger down the road. Yeah, we had the, I had the very good fortune of, uh, of being able to work when I transitioned to in the academic role with um, to bring Val Cooper on board, uh, who also worked in, in the acute pain service with me. So it was Val and I and the physician colleagues and things were we, we thought things were amusing before when val joined the team they got exponentially funnier uh, <laughs> and so it was fantastic it was a, a really great great opportunity i don't know if anyone else has uh, it it's fine super i i was able to, <laughs> to step into <laughs> some, some pretty giant shoes and i was very grateful to have Rosemary's mentorship then um after she was my my um, preceptor for a number of my courses in my MP program, and she sort of molded me into her her uh, to coming in after her as she was transitioning out of the full time role, and 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 she stood for me in my wedding, and so we've had a a really strong relationship um, for a number of years, and um, I I want to thank her for for all of her her teachings and her mentorship for sure. Um, and I, I just want to contribute a little bit to this conversation about about teams. I think that's one of the wonderful um, parts of being a nurse practitioner. I know in the many MP roles that I've held and, and currently in my role as a palliative care MP in the community, that being an MP provides um, insight for those of us, um, for those uh, partners that we have in the nursing profession and in the physician profession, because we sort of sit right in the middle. We have a, an eye and a sense of both sides of, of those goals. And so we can sometimes be a really good team member to help the other side appreciate what how the viewpoint that you know a nurse might have on a situation that perhaps a physician may not have ever thought and vice versa. So I, I think that nurse practitioners play a really unique role in helping to bring those two professions that maybe are used to working alongside each other but not really truly understanding the complexity of each other's work. Um, more uh, bring that more to the forefront and help everybody to sort of understand where we're all coming from so we can work together to a common goal. Thanks for sharing that, Valerie. I hadn't thought of that, that key bridging role. And, you know, Rosemary, maybe that is why you work so consciously in that role to create the team. I don't know if you had thought of it like that. I'll hand the floor over back to you again. I, we could talk about this for a while. Yeah, I, I think it, that's a, that makes an excellent point because the uh, I mean, it doesn't matter that we're doing some things that were had in the past traditionally part of the medical role. We're still nurses. We still have a nursing lens, nursing eyeballs, nursing perspectives, and it really is a, an interesting, interesting place to sit. I think, and it's so nice to see Val, the Wilson sisters. Yes, <laughs> I used to tell people Val was my daughter. <laughs> And to clarify, my maiden name was Wilson. So when yeah. I started on the pain service, we actually were the Wilson sisters. And yeah. people honestly, it took them people a minute and they're like, really? No. <laughs> <laughs> but Rosemary, what did you look like as a child? That's what I really want to oh, know. Oh, here you go, Damon. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> I told you there was going to be some ridiculous stuff. So um, I'm from Thunder Bay. Uh, and uh, Thunder Bay is up north. I'm sure many of you have driven through it uh, as, um, you know, at some points in your life. Uh, I was a dirty, muddy outdoor girl. I did a lot of sailing, a lot of skiing, a lot of just general outdoor stuff. Um, 
and I had the really great fortune to have the upbringing that I that I had. Um, and I think I am conscious of that because I I lived a privileged life. And so that with all the reflection that um, it includes, uh, it is what it is. So my father was an anesthesiologist. Um, he came to Canada from Bahrain, where he was the personal physician to the Sheikh, I understand, um, and uh, had a specialty in trop tropical medicine and hygiene, which uh, was not of much benefit in Canada, as it turns out. Um, he is in, from Britain. Uh, he lived most of his life breaking trails. Uh, he did acupuncture, he did residency at Sunnybrook in anesthesiology. Um, in the early 70s and went back to a city that had few anesthesiologists in Thunder Bay. Um, he did acupuncture, he did hypnosis, uh, his colleagues thought he was nuts. Um, but he was a really interesting guy. Um, he was my constant companion uh, growing up. I spent a ton of time with him. I went on rounds with him. We did house calls together. Um, there were probably weeks and weeks when my mother was busy or away that I slept in the call room outside the operating room um, at McKellar Hospital in Thunder Bay. I went on all of his rounds and put a stethoscope around my neck and a, and a uh, lab coat on me and said that I was his resident, um, which I'm sure um, fooled nobody. <laughs> uh, so he was a neat guy. I had influence from these folks too, so I was surrounded by healthcare. I mean, what else was I going to do? Um, on the right is my grandmother. She, her name is Catherine, Catherine McKinnon, who was. She ran away from home and changed her name to Catherine McKinnon um, so that people would know she was Finnish. And she ran away to Toronto and she went to did her nursing school there. Uh, she did so well, she got a Nightingale Scholarship from the Red Cross and graduated from the University of Toronto in 1927 with a diploma in public health. Um, CN Rail gave her a hospital card, which she outfitted herself. Uh, she was her own supply chain management person. She designed her own uniforms and she, they dragged her up behind the train to places up north into um, communities and left her there. Um, and she was beautiful. She had flaming red hair um, and she was a lovely, lovely human being. Um, and she did this amazing stuff. And my mother on the left um, did her baccalaureate in nursing in 1955 at UT when nobody had a baccalaureate in nursing. Um, her parents forbid her to get anything but a university degree. So she went off and found one that she could take because uh, she wanted, always wanted to be a nurse like her mother. Um, and did her master's degree in 1975 when dad was doing his residency at Sunnybrook. Um, when I would say that my mom thought I was going to be a tall, willowy ballet dancer. Um, I'm sure that that's true. Uh, but Miss Anna, my ballet teacher, uh, when it came clear that I was going to be five foot four and somewhat muscular, said, Mrs. Wilson, perhaps you might want to sign your daughter up for jazz, um, which I thought was funny. Uh, so sadly, dad died um, while I was doing my science degree at University of Waterloo. Um, and my dreams of going to medicine and his dream of me going into medicine um, just didn't happen. We had no money um, and my mom needed me. So I had to go home to Thunder Bay. And I was surrounded by these amazing nurses, my grandma, my mom, um, and my Aunt Marg Page. And so I went into nursing and I gotta say, I don't know if I have what, what kind of a physician I would have made, but uh, nursing has been the most amazing profession for me, um, I, it gives me, it makes me shake when I talk about it, so I apologize. Um, it's not been easy. Uh, so that's me hanging from the port side deck of that boat that's broaching. Um, it's a consequence in the Kingston Harbor of having too much sail up. So since coming to Kingston, it has been a wild ride. Um, I don't, I can't say that there's that even been more than six months when it hasn't been a wild ride since 2000. Um, the kids could attest to my late hours. Um, I was telling uh, Damon and Shana about the, the story about being in the emergency room. Actually, it was the night that the Kingston had um, the earthquake. And we were putting in an epidural 
in a patient, my colleague and I, um, in a patient that had a had been kicked by a cow, had a flail segment, so a bunch of broken ribs, um, and that's a recipe for disaster, right, Damon? So. Um, putting in an epidural and I got a page to the switchboard and I looked and had a look and I said, who this is Canadian, can I just get this page? It's, you know, it's important. So I picked up the phone and it was Sydenham Public School calling saying, Mrs. Wilson, it's 5.30. Um, are you gonna come get your children? So <laughs> I found somebody to cover for me and then I, I ran up to Sydenham and I remember the kids walking to the car and Thomas with his, my youngest with his little Pikachu backpack looking, climbing into the car and looking back at me and shaking his head saying, mom, you're not going to win mother of the year this year either. And being absolutely disgusted. Um, but during this time, the support of my colleagues uh, was key. Doing my PhD while doing this role full time was key. Um, moving to Queens has been an incredible experience. Moving to the chronic pain service, um, the chronic pain team at Hotel B has been incredible. And taking this academic practice role, um, the previous director taking a chance that chance on setting this up um, and Ernest supporting it is key because it's not been done before and it paved the way for people to come after and, and hopefully um, other people who might be on the call who might want to do their PhD and might want to move into an academic role and still practice in pain management now um, might want to do one of these roles uh, in the future um, because it's a really neat opportunity to meld all aspects of your practice um, in nursing. But what happens when it's tiring and you run out of wind? So another opportunity to take a bit of a break. Um, so Rosemary, I really like the, the contrast or the juxtaposition of the uh, sailing at full speed, maxed out, uh, you know, probably to the limit of your sailing expertise, followed followed by complete calmness, um, and it makes it certainly makes me think of my own uh, career trajectory and in things that happen. And you know, um, we often uh, get too many balls in the air. Um, or things change, things happen, and we get sort of some forced rest. Uh, although I'm not a sailor, uh, I know that you, you know, sometimes it can be windy and then the wind. Um, and I, I, I wonder if you could comment, Rosemary, a little bit on, you know, forced rest and recovery versus burnout versus trying to be patient for uh, when the wind blows again. Um, you know, what your sort of uh, interpretation of this slide that you put up? Well, I think this, this is an example of, like it is forced rest. When you're, when you're sailing and there's no wind, what are you gonna do? I mean, you pour yourself a gin and tonic and you just wait for the, the, the wind to pick up again, basically, right? So, um, but it's not so easy to cope with when you're used to running a thousand miles an hour. You know, I asked my husband, he'll, he'll tell you, she can't sit still. Um, but you have to, like this illusion of being busy for us, it's, it's an epidemic, it's, you know, not, not like COVID, but, you know, a, not a pandemic, but this idea that we have to be busy all the time, um, we don't, we need to take a break, we need to have evenings when we don't check our emails, because we will burn out, and it is no fun, it is absolutely, take it from me, it is no fun, you're no good to anybody, not to yourself, not to your kids, not to your colleagues, and especially not to your patients and students, so, um, that's Rosemary, I was wondering if with, you know, not getting into more detail than you're comfortable with, but if you could tell one of your stories of a time when maybe you felt a, a little bit more burnt out than usual, or, you know, like an inflection point uh, over the last 20 years where you realized that that's maybe what was going on. Oh, I would say probably year three, three or four of my doctoral work and trying to work full time and you know, with the kids, I, I gotta say that uh, um, if it hadn't been for my parents stepping, my mom and her husband stepping in um, to look after the kids and to look after me, if they just cooked me meals and, you know, I, I would have been sunk. There is absolutely no question. That was the hardest 
time. So I had to make money. Um, I had to keep my job going. I had to look after the patients. My colleagues depended on me. Um, what was I going to do, right? So, yeah, I, I would say I almost quit. <laughs> but I didn't, fortunately. I think one of my, one of my colleagues that that's, I work with now who is on my thesis committee said, just get it done. Just get it done and move on. Put your head down, get it done. She was right. Um, thanks for that, Rosemary. Rosemary, Nicole um, has written here in the chat talking about the challenges of inconsistent funding within healthcare institutions for the NP role. Um, budgets and, and if uh, just want, and wondering if you have any comments or similar past experiences to sort of speak to that comment that she has um, yep. about, you know, just permanent funding for NPs uh, as uh, essential members of the healthcare team. Well, I, I, the best thing, Nicole, I can say is data, 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 data. Collect data. You know, prove your collect, find the outcomes that are sensitive to what it is that you do and, and show the difference that you're making in length of stay, in patient satisfaction, in, you know, whatever the outcome happens to be that's sensitive to your interventions. Um, I, that was key to the maintenance, I think, of the pain service with KGH. It was key to the construction of the chronic pain team at Hotel Du. Um, the data speaks. Right, so, um, and not just that, you, you have to, I mean, you make yourself part of the furniture and it's, and it's hard to do without you, I guess, but, but uh, you know, the research, I think, speaks for itself. There's lots of research out there. Sometimes you have to make your own. Sometimes you can, you can use that to build your case. I think it's too bad that it's, you know, it's not a uniform thing, um, but we're all cost constrained, right? So you have to show that you're going to, save the institution money and you're going to improve care and um, it's, it's part of the reality of doing business these days. Uh, thanks Rosemary. I'm um, going to let you continue on with your last couple of slides and then uh, we'll have a lot more time to keep chatting. Okay. So uh, Einstein said life's like riding a bicycle. You have to keep moving. So do something different every day. Um, my guys are amazing. I am really blessed. I can sail. I get to work with amazing colleagues um, here at the School of Nursing, Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative Medicine, Rehab, um, Medicine, the chronic pain, my chronic pain colleagues. Um, I get to work with inspiring students. And most importantly, I still touch patients. And um, I, I don't think I could ever give that up. The body work of nursing sustains me in so many aspects of, of my role. And nursing is about body work, um, absolutely. So one of the most important things about trust as well is for patients and trust in patients. And that's the last little bit of what I want to talk about. Um, a little bit more evidence. So uh, I hear from gynae oncology and I thought this was a super interesting study. Um, they talked about the embodied, embodied phenomenon of trust how there's bridges uh, formed by past experience. So sometimes as providers, we have to provide, we have to be that bridge between what patients have experienced before and how it is now. Um, trust in this case was, was constructed based on a collection of verbal and nonverbal signs and patients know. Um, so the verbal information and contracts that, that you as a clinician have uh, with your patients and the clinical agendas you put together are validated by nonverbal signs, which I thought was, um, you know, you, you intuitively know that that's true, but nice to see it um, in a study. Being approachable and unthreatening um, helps patients to see that you think they're more than just a body. Um, and that's important. This idea that a serious disposition, um, when you're talking to patients, is a bit of a mixed blessing. So sometimes if you're serious, uh, you seems less human, but sometimes if you're serious, people think you know a lot. So, um, but basically uh, these patients wanted us to know that, that they want us to be present and human. And this guy, um, Gaston Nirajira, from, he's an anesthesiologist from, from uh, Rwanda that I've worked with. He seems to know. It's in his skin. 
to work with patients and to establish trust. Um, and we've worked with him. His trust is relevant to all settings. And his they, patients all call him Dr. Gaston, and they know when they see Dr. Gaston, good things are going to happen. Um, and there is the whole beer theme again, I think, uh, working with uh, Rylan Egan and, and Jessica uh, Baumhauer. Uh, the team, uh, once again, having, con having conversations over beer, key. The last thing I want to talk to you about is this idea of um, epistemic injustice. So this is the chronic pain patients that I see and my colleagues see as well. So oftentimes when we see patients in chronic pain, they have been through many, many, many healthcare providers before they get to us. Um, sometimes they have been in conditions where maybe they weren't trusted or they were second guessed or their symptoms were um, downplayed. Um, and because sometimes we look for objective indicators that somebody has pain. Um, they've had all their pain experiences questioned. If they're on opiates, maybe you can add suspicion uh, and uh, being discredited. So sometimes our patients are dealing with this distrust and stigma um, and this overall idea that they've dealt with social injustice and it, it can damage their trust uh, in us. Um, and also all of this can be tied up in marginalization as well. So we need to be careful about that. So these authors have said, which I think is really, really interesting, being epistemically humble means correcting for prejudicial prejudicial credibility judgments. We recognize that medical decisions are almost always accompanied by uncertainty and that the testimony of pain sufferers can help complete the clinical scenario. So I think we do need to consider the limits of clinical expertise. It doesn't mean that we trust unreflexively um, we, or reflectively, we have to think about things. But if we have general, genuine interest in the patient experience, um, we build trust with them. And that's one of the things that I love about chronic pain is that I can sit with a patient. I can learn all about their lives. I can touch them. Um, because many of them don't have anybody that will even hold their hand um, in their world. And I think that's the, one of the most wonderful things about working in interdisciplinary teams. In the chronic pain team, we, we have opportunities to discuss amongst each other. We have physiotherapy, occupational therapy, social work, um, psychology, my physician colleagues with a, um, a tremendous wealth of experience and, and uh, um, skill, and my nursing colleagues, uh, RPNs and registered nurses within the clinic, and our very, very important um, unit clerks and uh, data entry people. The team works together. The collaboration is wonderful. Um, we're still working. Well, we'll be working until we stop working together, I guess, but um, the interdisciplinarity of the clinic is, is truly magical and wonderful, um, and I feel very blessed to be part of it. So Brené Brown, once again, uh, says, to be human, we have to have a strong back, a soft front, and a wild heart. Um, and I thank you for attending, and thank you for being human in your practices.